Hi, my name is Suraj Pai and in this module I'll be talking about logistic regression. Firstly, we're going to visualize logistic regression and how it can classify between two classes of data. Today's lecture will not cover multiple classes but this will be discussed in neural networks later on. We will build a lot on the content covered in linear regression looking how we can take formulas from there and slightly adapt them to make it work with logistic regression. Then we will see how we can use logistic regression to make predictions on the classification of new data. Now let's look at an example. Say you are at a hospital that stores data about patients with breast cancer. The data may describe the different attributes of the cancer tumor as well as the known or labeled classes of the tumor. The attributes refer to the input features X and the classes are the outputs Y. Together, X and Y obviously make the training set. Now in the figure provided, a class of 1 has a cross and a class of 0 has a circle. Here, we see that there is potentially a pattern that machine learning can help us find. Logistic regression will be able to create a function that will separate these two groups of classes. It is important to note that this function need not be linear. For example, if you pass polynomial features, you can achieve polynomial boundaries. And that if you prefix our training set, the row of ones to support bias terms, we can also have a non-zero y-intercept. A doctor may now be able to use this decision boundary to postulate whether a patient has a benign or a malignant tumor. This need not exist in two dimensions either. We can do this for n features. We will look more at this decision boundary later on. So, we want our model to output either a 0 or a 1. Obviously, there is a stark difference from linear regression where we would output any real number. We may want to use the step function, which outputs 1 at and after some arbitrary learn threshold, and 0 before that. If we were to apply the necessary transformations to this function, we could use it for our predictions. However, two major issues are posed. This function is not continuous and hence cannot be optimized or trained. This is the main issue. Though we could treat it as a piecewise function and get the derivative that way, the derivative would always be zero, hence no training can occur, they die. If a patient really has a 0.48 chance of having a cancer tumor, should we neglect that and label it as a perfect zero? Hence, this function cannot tell us its confidence in individual predictions. Thus, we should be moving away from discrete outputs of zero and one and instead into continuous ones. What we do is we reduce the dichotomy of the variable into a probability of the truth of one class. For example, instead of representing a cancer tumor as being benign or malignant, we represent it as the probability of being malignant on a sliding scale of 0 to 1. All probabilities are between 0 and 1 inclusive, so we need a function that can simulate this. Luckily, such function exists, and it is called the sigmoid function. It is also commonly referred to as the logistic function, which is where the name logistic regression stems from. The formula for the sigmoid function has been provided as well as a graph, but as you can see, it is much like the step function, but it's smooth. Continuous shape allows for training. Now, some further notes on the sigmoid function. These can all be easily shown mathematically, but we will skip over that step and just look at the features. As mentioned, the sigmoid function is continuous and hence differentiable and can be trained. The range of the function is between 0 and 1, exclusive. It asymptotes at 0 and 1. Could it be argued that this is not a true probability? A possible intuition for this is that we can never be truly certain about 1 or 0. A y-intercept exists at 0, 0, 0,5. Many people would suggest that any output greater or equal to 0 0.5 could be rounded to the class of 1 and 0 otherwise in prediction. This is called a prediction or decision threshold. It also implies that when x is greater than or equal to 0, we predict true, else we predict false. This is relevant for a separating function. Hence, at g of 0, we change from false to true. Keep this in mind. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. Why is this algorithm called logistic regression? This is a classification algorithm, the very opposite of a regression. Well, one can actually claim that in a sense, separating classification from regression here is an epistemological 
category error. Our algorithm here is outputting real numbers like a linear regression, but only from 0 to 1 exclusive. We achieve this by using the logistic function to constrain the output range. Hence, in a sense, we are regressing probabilities. This is why it's called logistic regression. So what is the model we use in logistic regression? Where do the weights or parameters come in? In fact, what we do is we take the original weighted sum linear regression hypothesis model and simply pass it as an input of the sigmoid function as a composite function. One may ask, why do we do this? Well, we need to parameterize the sigmoid function so that we apply the necessary transformations finding the most optimal weights that enable it to predict most accurately on our data. As mentioned before, we are regressing on the probability. Now, what cost function do we use for logistic regression? Most commonly, we use something much more complex and scary, the log likelihood error function. This is different to the mean squared error function used in logistic regression, in linear regression. But why? Well, remember that a hypothesis function in logistic regression includes the sigmoid function. The sigmoid function is nonlinear, and if we were to directly plug it into the mean squared error cost function, we would actually end up with a non-convex function. A non-convex function has local maximas where we can get stuck quite easily, and this is obviously not good for training. Though it looks scary, the summation and division by m are obvious. The average or the total training error set. However, we can break the inner sum down into two parts. Part 1 and part 2. In part 1, we multiply, the log we multiply the logarithm of the hypothesis function by output y of i and in part 2, we multiply 1 minus y of i by the logarithm of 1 subtracted by the hypothesis function. Let's expand on what this does in the next slide. If you are having a hard time understanding, you do not need to know much of math to do this. In part 1, because it includes the term y of i, and y of i is always either 0 or 1. When y of i is 0, the entire term will disappear, leaving us only with a second. It's the same with part 2. When y of i is 1, 1 minus y of i equal to 0, and hence it cancels out. Thus, only one of the terms will effectively exist at each iteration, and the other will cancel out. What do the logs do? Simply, they provide a nice way to score the error. This is shown in the two figures down below. When y of i equal to 1, the logarithm function in part 1 would be the only actual thing computed. On the left hand side is part 1's logarithm function, which experiences an x-intercept at 1. Notice that it asymptotes vertically at x equal to 0. This does not matter since sigmoid function cannot output 0, but it captures the intuition that if there are infinite intangible cause the error when we predict 0 for an actual output of 1. Same logic applies for the log graph in part 2, which is log 1 minus x instead of log of x. As per usual, to find the most optimum weights, we must optimize or minimize a log likelihood cost function, g of w. Just like linear regression, we can use an iterative method like gradient descent, where we use the sign of the gradient to infer the direction of our steps or the position of a minimum point relative to our current position, and the size of the gradient to infer the size of our step. After many iterations, we will reach at the minimum point. Also like linear regression's mean squared error, log likelihood is a convex function, so we will always reach the global minimum point. However, unlike linear regression and MSE, no normal equation or analytical solution exists. Thus, we must use gradient descent and other iterative methods. One may now ask, how insanely complex is the derivative of the log likelihood function? Actually, it's a miracle, or perhaps not so much, as this is another reason sigma was chosen. Because the derivative of the log likelihood function is exactly the same as the derivative of the MSE cost function in linear regression. How convenient. You might want to go back to lesson 4.1 to review what the derivative looked like. Now we need to figure out how to convert the probabilities that we get from our model into a discrete class. To do this, we must create a decision rule. Earlier, we discussed that if a probability is 0.5 or greater than, it means that by rounding it up, it corresponds to a discrete class of 1 or true. If it is smaller than 0.5, it belongs to the class of 0 or false. 
Remember that the y-intercept of the sigmoid function is 0, 0, 0.5. So as soon as we input 0 into the sigmoid function, we get an output class of 1. Anything smaller than 0, and we get an input class, I mean, sorry, output class of 0. Now, recall that we use the weighted sum w transpose x as the input to our sigmoid function. Using the logic, this means that when w transpose x is 0, or above, we assert a class of 1, else we assert a class of 0. Now, decision boundary is simply the function w transpose x equal to 0. When one plots this line, one will find that the region to the right hand side is where w transpose of x is greater than 0, and hence such region is classified as class 1, or is red in the example shown. Similarly, on the left hand side of the input value, the region is that of class 0. Or blue. Thus, we say that the decision boundary is at the decision rule junction because it separates two oppositively classified regions. Hopefully, this also provides clarification to the process of applying a logic to the weighted sum. Here, it can directly be seen that when we optimize on the weights, we're trying to formulate the decision boundary with the best separating ability. Here, you can see a brief explanation of multi-class logistic regression. We use the one versus all method, where we pick out each class and train it against the combination of all other classes. Now, once we have a train model edge transpose of... Once we have a train model edge of x, here is how the prediction process goes. First, we fetch the data. Then we insert feature data into the vector x, then we feed x into h of x, store this value in p of x. If p of x is greater than 0 0.5 or equal to 0 0.5, then we classify it as true, else we can classify it as false. We use classification to perform some final action. And that concludes our video. This course was created as a part of the Stanford Crowd Course Initiative, the world's first massive online open coursework developed entirely by an online community. If you'd like to learn more about us or view more courses, visit crowdcourse.stanford.edu.